people connected online. Thank you. The, the system has just announced the recording has started. So, um, so, so I guess we can we can get going. So, um, to introduce us um, for the, the session of this afternoon, we have Rick Short from the NDA is going to give a short introduction, and then we have um, two two technical presentations um, to give on the area of land quality. So, um, just to pass you over to Rick to get us started. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, as Mark said, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction. Um, I'm Rick Short, and I'm a, a research manager at the uh, uh, Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Um, and so, I look after the direct research portfolio uh, through uh, which we fund the PhD bursary scheme. Uh, I'm also the strategic authority for university research as well, um, hence my involvement in this. Um, and I'm just going to give you a, a very brief introduction as to um, why we're running these webinars and, and what relevance they may have to you. So if we could have the next slide, please. So um, we're running webinars in each of the areas um, under which we have uh, themes in the bursary call. Um, we've already done a couple of these webinars now. Um, so we've done spent fuel and nuclear materials. We've done the waste packaging and storage webinar as well. Um, and uh, today we're doing the uh, land quality webinar. Um, the webinars that have already gone, we're going to put records of those um, on the um, NNL website eventually. So you, if you are interested in any of those other themes, um, you'll be able to go back um, and uh, listen to the discussion uh, that we've had in those areas uh, already. Let's get up the next slide, please. So. Um, the way that we're running these webinars um, is that we have some uh, technical experts on the line, and they're going to give you um, a brief introduction to the topic itself and the kind of um, needs and requirements that the sites have in these areas. Um, and by running these things as, as a webinar, um, this is obviously giving the um, industrial lead an opportunity to communicate their, their research needs to academia and uh, giving the options for the academics to get involved um, and send us some questions and, and talk to the technical leads directly um, about uh, some of the issues that, that, that might crop up, any questions that they have that might help them um, write a better proposal effectively for the bursary call. And as it says at the bottom of the slide there, the aim is to make sure that, that all the proposals are, are better aligned with the call. Um, so if you have the next slide. So a quick piece of housekeeping, um, we're going to give about 25 minutes of presentations in total, and that will leave around half an hour for, for questions at the end. Um, if you think of any questions during the presentations itself, um, you can click on the little speech bubble in the top right-hand corner and type in your questions um, via, that, via that method. At the end of the presentations, um, we'll go through any questions that have come up during that period and we'll get the technical guys to um, address those questions. And, and just one last thing, please bear in mind this is a public forum, um, and please respect the decisions of the presenters on what they decide that they do want to answer and what they decide that they don't want to answer. Obviously, we need to avoid any uh, sensitive topics. Um, so, as I say, yeah, please, please, uh, please respect their decision on that. And uh, with that, I'll hand back to uh, Mark, uh, who will introduce the first presenter. Yeah, thanks, Rick. So, um, yes, as Rick mentioned, there's a text entry system for um, entering questions. You can enter them at any time, and they'll be um, addressed at the end of the presentation. So, just to start us off, we have Nick Atherton from Sellafield Limited. He's going to present on um, land, land quality. So, over to Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Nick Atherton from Sellafield Limited. I'm a technical manager in the land quality department, and, and in general, I provide advice and lead technical delivery of projects on site. Um, it includes developing new technologies and nuclearization of existing technologies, um, and also providing good advice on the management of existing land and groundwater contamination, and looking at planning for site restoration on the site. Um, ho hopefully, on the line somewhere is. Richard Short and Bill Thompson from Dune Ray as well, who are going to help out with some of the, the slides later on. Um, 
just to introduce the working group that I'm involved in. Um, the working group on land quality is also a subgroup of the nuclear industry group on land quality. <coughs> and uh, through that group, we bring together uh, contaminated land and site restoration managers uh, from across the NDA estate um, and bring them alongside representatives from non-NDA sites um, such as uh, defence sites and other other nuclear sites. And, and through this group, we, we commission uh, reports and guidance notes from um, contracting the direct research portfolio. And we also have an overview of the, the bursary scheme and we, we, we feed in our our needs for the diversity scheme, which, which is what we're going to present for you today. Um, and also, we, we keep in the back of our minds that in the future as well, we need to bring new and keen people into the industry um, to, to cover any skill shortage we're going to have in the future. Uh, so, if you want to move on to the next slide. So, this gives a, this slide here gives an example of a few of the projects that we've let through the direct research portfolio over the last few years. Uh, you can see there's a bit of a mix there between um, fairly generic guidance documents that we've asked uh, companies to produce for us, as well as uh, looking at uh, different parts of the industries and what, what technologies are available uh, for different future activities that we'll have on our sites. And it's worth bearing in mind that uh, through the uh, Nuclear Industry Working Group, we're, we're pulling together uh, a lot of sites that are all in very, very different stages of their, of their lifetime. Um, and as Sellafield is technically still an operational site, we're, we're moving more into decommissioning, uh, but we're still very much focused on uh, supporting the civil nuclear industry and waste management activities. Uh, Dune Ray are, are a bit further along their, their lifetime than us. They're doing some decommissioning and, and site cleanup at the moment. Shall we go to the next slide? So this just really introduces the the PhD topics that we've put forward for this year's bursary scheme. Um, for people that have been involved in the bursary scheme in the past, you'll see that a few of the topics are the same as last year, uh, but we have added some new ones in there. Um, I think the next, the next sort of section of the slides, we're going to go into each topic in, in more detail and um, hopefully promote some, some questions from you guys on each area. Um, so if you want to move on to the next one? Okay, so this, this is one of the topics that we had in uh, the bursary scheme for the last couple of years. Um, and it's, it, it's one really that uh, is, is quite close to, to what we do at, at, at Sellafield. We've, we've, we've got a future need to restore our site and, and we recognise that part of that site restoration is going to involve excavating a lot of material from the site and, and managing potentially contaminated groundwater in the meantime. Um, there's also the potential for us to have um, a long-term impact of contaminated groundwater on our site, which might need managing in the future. And so we're really interested to see new technologies come through that can treat uh, groundwater that's contaminated with relatively low levels of sensitive radionuclei such as technetium, carbon-14 and strontium. Um, and we're, we're, I suppose we're generally looking for fairly simple methods. We're, we're looking for methods that we can deploy in a, in a site restoration setting rather than a, uh, an ongoing operational site like we've got now. Um, we have had a, a PhD aligned to this topic. Uh, it's ongoing at the moment. Um, and that, that's looking at ex situ treatment more, but we're not necessarily just focused on ex situ treatment. I think there's some really interesting work going on on in situ treatments for groundwater that we can bring into this topic area as well. Um, and uh, uh, I suppose the, the, the sort of vision for this is, is looking for um, a sustainable solution for, for long term management of contaminated groundwater. Okay, this is, this is another topic that has been in for a few years now. The, um, m most of our nuclear sites in the UK have groundwater monitoring programs. Um, 
they're generally quite long running programs. Certainly, the one at Salafield has been running since the late 1970s, and we we spend a lot of time and effort collecting groundwater samples and uh, analysing them, and then reviewing the data, and, and really reassuring ourselves that that we're, we're managing groundwater contamination uh, correctly, and that we understand it um, and how it changes in the future. So I think the, the vision again in this area is a move away from sending people out and collecting lots of groundwater samples to a, a, a system of groundwater sensors that can, can tell us when we've got changes in our boreholes. Um, a lot of the contaminants we're concerned with, um, such as technetium, strontium-99 and carbon-14, do have a potential uh, off-site consequence. Um, we we need to understand really uh, how, how they behave and, and where, where we're getting changes in groundwater concentrations over time. Um, and have, having a, a sort of installed system of, or a sensor network across a site um, will certainly allow us to do that a lot more easily. Um, well, one of the things we've done at Stellarfield quite a lot, we've, we've, we've had to do fairly intensive groundwater sampling campaigns where we've, we've taken daily and weekly samples and. It soon, it soon mounts up in, in terms of effort you have to put into it and cost you have to put into it. So having a system fully installed that we can we can just collect data from as and when required and change frequency of data collection as and when required is a real big advantage. And then as we, as we look forward into um, the site restoration phases and, and beyond, um, there is a likelihood that we'll have groundwater monitoring going on for many, many years into the future. So a less uh, labour-intensive system um, would also offer big benefits there. Um, and this is one of the areas where there's a, there's a potential crossover with uh, another working group that we've got on characterisation. Um, we have worked quite closely on, on looking at um, groundwater sampling systems with them before. So th th this one's focusing more on natural attenuation. Um, and it really comes from the recognition that it, it may not be practicable or sustainable to remove all the um, contaminated soils during the site restoration phase, and it's, it's recognised as part of the NDA strategy to, to consider natural attenuation options. Um, so it is something we've looked at at Sellafield. Um, it's uh, at the moment, we, we struggle slightly looking at it because there's a, a bit of a lack of underpinning science behind it. We, uh, uh, it, because of that situation, it's difficult to have um, a full conversation with our regulators orders about the benefits of natural attenuation over, over a more engineered approach. Um, but, but everyone does recognise that there is a need to, to consider all these options and um, I mean, just just looking at Sellafield for an example, um, being able to to leave some contamination behind, uh, not having to export it to a disposal facility, is going to offer a big advantage, not just cost-wise, but also environmentally. Just just avoiding having to move material around and 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 fill in holes with clean material from somewhere else. So. There's a, there's a massive range of radionuclides here that, that could fall into this category. Uh, common ones, technetium, strontium, carbon-14, cesium and the, the uranium plutonium isotopes. Um, we understand that not all of them may be amenable for natural attenuation, depending on their behavior, but we so like to explore as many options as we can. Um, and essentially, we need to consider how how we can underpin our safety cases and our post-closure assessments when it comes to site restoration and, and, and any delicensing we might do in the future. Um, and, and it, it, into that equation comes in more into the NDA court, the long-term management of liabilities on these sites and, and how, we can, how we can ensure that even if we are using a natural attenuation approach for managing the contamination. And again, just to but there is an ongoing PhD aligned to this topic area uh, within the bursary scheme. So the, 
next one is a new one. Um, we're in the bursary this year, and it's focused on uh, concrete, essentially, and the potential for contaminated concrete on sites. Uh, many of you are probably aware that um, concrete's a big feature in nuclear construction, and there's a lot of deep, deep foundations and, and structures within the ground made of concrete. Um, and the situations where the concrete itself has become contaminated or potentially contaminated. Um, and we need to understand what happens to these below ground structures in the future, whether we whether there's an ongoing risk associated with them and uh, if we did leave them in situ, how the contaminants could be released over time, how they would affect the ground and groundwater environment and what what, what long term risk they present if we did leave them behind. And this, this is really needed to underpin any decision making we're doing on um, whether we leave structures behind on site or within the ground, such as foundations, old drains, that sort of thing, um, or whether we have to, uh, to remove them and, and um, scour the land. Um, <clears throat> and, and another part of the equation there really is to be able to characterize the contaminant. If we, if we don't know what level of contamination there is, um, where the contamination is in the, in the concrete structure, um, we can't. We also can't underpin the decision making process as well. Uh, again, potential crossover with the other working groups here. This is as well as the characterisation working group, decommissioning working group as well. Um, so moving on to the next topic, then we've another new one in the bursary scheme, and this is. This is focused a little bit more on, on decision making rather than a, a technology as such. Um, it, you know, it's a, using the use of statistical methods to underpin decisions. It's relatively common nowadays, but it's not something that we, we use very regularly within the management of contaminated land and groundwater on, on nuclear sites. Um, the main areas of focus here is, is the ability to be able to identify areas of concern um, uh, statistical analysis to underpin um, how we manage contamination in situ and also looking at potential for de-licensing of, of areas of sites. There's, there's been a bit of a lack of stakeholder acceptance when it comes to the use of statistical approaches, um, whether that's from unfamiliarity or distrust, I'm not really sure, but um, it, it's probably held back the adoption of, of sounds sound statistical techniques to, to underpin our decisions. Um, but at the same time, we do need to be able to quantify the uncertainty in decision making and the underpinning data. We, and we also need to demonstrate the safety performance of options going forward and, and using the statistical approach to do that is, is beneficial. Um, we, we do suffer slightly from a lack of capability within the industry, I think. Um, um, so, so when we when we come to use statistical techniques for looking at comparisons and um, decisions against lines of evidence, uh, it can be rather tricky. Uh, and then just to point out again, there's a potential crossover with the characterisation working group in, in this area too. Okay, the next the next topic has come from a slightly different source. This one, this is looking at waste scenarios and. Uh, nuclear sites, and specifically the chemotoxicity of the radionuclides rather than the radiotoxicity. Uh, this, is a, this is a topic that was brought to us by the Environment Agency um, and has come out of recent discussions on, on nuclear waste management. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the sort of background here is that, that they would like to see radionuclides and hazard materials treated in a consistent and common risk management approach using consistent assumptions and um, consistent criteria in the evaluation of the risk. No, this isn't necessarily commonly the case. It, it often differs between chemotoxic hazardous materials and, and radioactive hazardous materials. Um, the, the second bullet point on this slide uh, puts forward the proposed sort of research topic in, in one line really is that it's to review the international approaches the assessment of co-contamination of radioactive and chemotoxic substances, um, and look, look, looking across 
uh, Europe and seeing or even even in the world and seeing different ways that people do this. Um, at, at the moment, I think the, the waste assessment community and the contaminated land community are not always able to to do a full assessment on this due to the quality of the sort of background information and lack of supporting science that, that has, um, I suppose, led us to treat it as slightly different topic areas. Uh, some more more scientific underpinning would be useful and also it would help us looking at how we could manage material in situ on, on sites as well as, as ex situ disposal. And then the final topic is uh, looking at the uh, next generation of analytical instruments. Um, as, as we uh, move from uh, operational sites into decommissioning and, and site restoration activities, uh, we often up the amount of sampling analysis we do. Um, it's certainly a hot topic at, at Sellafield at the moment. Um, over time, the, uh, most sites have got their own sort of analytical capabilities or, or subcontract out to other, other facilities, and a lot of that's been um, focused about operating a site. So there's a lot of the analysis methods and the, um, the, the numbers of samples that can, can be uh, put through a lab are, are based on the need to support operational plants. But as we move into decommissioning, there's, there's different challenges come along. Um, there's a bigger focus on uh, characterization uh, of buildings and equipment uh, to, to feed into decommissioning uh, plans. Uh, and this is in previous, uh, re recent history has had some bottlenecks and delays in, in projects. Just because the samples aren't getting turned around quick enough, we're not. We're, we're, we're basically flooding the market with, with samples, and the labs aren't able to cope. Um, so the potential focus area here is um, maybe new methods, more more fa faster methods um, that allow us to to get get data quickly to feed into some of the decommissioning decisions we need to make. Um, and this topic area also addresses a potential skills gap we've got coming up in the future as well on, on analytical chemistry and and, and radio ecology. Um, I was I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day on, on this area and, and he expressed um, you know 10 15 years ago when we were setting up something like a thought we'd have loads of um, research chemists in the labs developing methods. Um, and we're just not getting those sort of people in, into the industry much anymore, um, which, is a, which is a potential problem in the future. Uh, and that's that's, the, that's all the slides. Um, I think if, if Richard or Billy are there from Dune Ray, they might want to say something as well. Thanks, Thanks Richard. It's Richard Short speaking from Dune Ray. Um, unfortunately, Bill couldn't be with me today, so I've got Bob Kerr who's standing in for him. Um, I think the main points that I wanted to make are really to probably just put a bit of a background on where Dunray is and, and sort of the issues that we encounter on site. Um, so going back to the, um, the treatment of groundwater, uh, we've got the Technetium-99 and Strontium-90. Uh, Strontium-90 is probably our biggest issue on site, but we also have um, smaller issues with the uranium series, especially associated with old waste disposal sites. So there may be a future case where we'd be treating large volumes of groundwater with a, a low level uranium contamination. I think the um, second project area where we'd be very interested is the, um, so the remote measuring techniques, especially with um, contaminated structures in situ. Uh, we've had a number of buildings that we've decommissioned um, where we've had to sample concrete and the method that we've identified to date has been diamond coring and then the cores are then crushed and sent off for lab analysis and this has proved to be a really time consuming and expensive method and there's also some areas where we can't use this technique where we've got groundwater being held behind a, a concrete wall for instance and to try and identify what might be present in that concrete wall without breaching the containment would be really useful. I think Bob has a couple of comments with um, respect to the last slide. Yeah, in terms of uh, the 
uh, an expansion of the, the performance envelope of uh, the latest generation of analytical instruments. Uh, one of the key things for trying to clear a site to eventually de-license the site or to surrender its uh, radioactive substances at 1993 uh, authorization or uh, Environmental Permitting Regulations Permit in Golden Wales, um, we, we will need to be able to demonstrate uh, clearance of the site to suitably low levels. One of the big issues is the detection of actinides such as plutonium and uranium in the field. And you've got very vast sites with uh, potentially hundreds of acres to clear, then uh, in situ measurements of these actinides really uh, useful in terms of new products coming to uh, the market or to the industry. The other uh, thing that we've got on our radar uh, is, is changes in legislation. And there's a, a new EC directive uh, which will come into force in the United Kingdom in 2018, uh, which is which changes the clearance and exemption levels for radioactive substances. Uh, this has got a crossover with some of the decommissioning and characterization working groups, but uh, we will be very interested in technologies that can help clear ground and detect radioactivity in samples to levels that are below those in the uh, new EC directive. Then that's pretty much all we've got, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our presenters this afternoon. Um, my name is Laurie McDermott. I work at the National Nuclear Laboratory, um, and I'll be um, voicing your questions that you type in on the comments box, um, which is available for anybody listening. If they have any questions they'd like to pose to our presenters or any of the uh, people who you know are attending today. Bruce? Got one question from Fabrice. Uh, can you say a bit more about the change in legislation that was just discussed? Yeah, uh, it's the basic safety standard uh, that's been approved by the European Union. The previous 1996 BSS basic safety standard has been updated and there's a number of changes uh, that have been uh, approved in the new EC directive. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Britain has got uh, four years to implement the new directive and uh, UK government doesn't implement directives uh, before the date of the directive or after the date, so it's to be enforced by, I think it's the 6th of February 2018. Uh, and this new, uh, the revised directive will be uh, getting discussed by uh, uh, the various regulators in the UK uh, with suitable stakeholder engagement uh, to revise uh, our ionising radiations regulations 1999. It will lead to a revision of the Radioactive Substances Act 1993 in Scotland and Northern Ireland and a revision of the Environmental Permitting Regulations 2010 in England and Wales. Uh, I remember the C directive number off the top of my head, uh, but uh, that, that's information can be made available if required. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, we'll just give people a few more minutes for their questions to come through as it takes a little while um, for them to actually clear through the internet connection. So we do have um, our next webinar, which is on the topic of decommissioning, which is scheduled for tomorrow, that's the 30th of September 2015, from 1 till 2 p.m. for those interested who would like to join us again. Uh, 
Um, unless we get anything um, in the next minute or so, um, we'll call this webinar to a close. I'd like to thank um, all of the presenters um, for their contributions and presentations and information they've provided. And I hope that um, the audience found them very useful in terms of an insight into the requirements and issues and current drivers that are there within the land quality um, group and where their priorities lie and that those um, well, the dialogue provided has given you um, some, things, some food for thought and will help you in formulating your proposals for the NDA bursary program. So as we've had no other questions at this time, um, thank you very much everybody and um, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at one o'clock.